who utilizes social media, not not related to posting things, but who actually has a Facebook account, who has an Instagram account, who has an OnlyFans account. Who utilizes social media? All right, so maybe about a third of the people in here. You didn't mention LinkedIn. LinkedIn, LinkedIn, and any, okay. yes, anything that's related to social media. Let's just, again, oh, buddy. <laughs> All right, so that's about maybe half to 60% use that. All right, that's a pretty decent number. But how many of you, show of hands again, actually use it and post things or do things to promote either yourself or your practice? Show of hands. All right, so maybe a few less than, than who raised them to begin with, right? So it's a tool, right? There's only so many different ways that one could get patients. There's only so many different ways that one could make themselves known at this point, right? And it's not just at this point knowing about being a local doctor and having your, your practice within town or whatnot. You know, it's about having people know who you are and what you're doing on a non-local level, but whether it's a national or even international level. So it's, it's an important tool to be able to use and probably the most effective tool and able to, uh, to be doing something like that, where just you can click something and you have a post that's there or you have just a video or whatever it is and you are you know, accessible to people all over the world. And it's pretty cool to have that. So I wanted to discuss kind of the finer details of everything there. Um, why is it important, really? Social media provides a glimpse, at least, into your practice, who you stand for, and it's done through you know the word content. Probably you've heard content being said very often recently. That's sort of one of these buzzwords of social media, and it's important. So who looks at social media? A lot of times, it's not even you know, patients that matter as much, but it's your colleagues. It's people who could potentially become patients. It could be staff members where you know you want to build up a good um, work culture or rapport within your company or your practice. You can get people involved with social media. You know, I don't like a lot of the, the TikTok dances and things like that, but some practices might. And, that's a way of incorporating um, nurse practitioners and medical assistants and uh, anyone else, you know, other than perhaps physicians themselves, you know, into this. So I know a lot of practices utilize that and they, they're successful with it. Um, what are the types of social media? We talked about maybe different platforms, which could be used like LinkedIn and Instagram and Facebook and all that, but there's a plethora of different ways that you could actually create content. Right? So you could do a video of a procedure or you discussing something. Um, there's pictures of the same types of things, right? Um, articles, you could basically take a picture of an article or uh, post that somewhere and that's, you know, in a way of self-bragging but also getting information, you know, out there too that can really be valuable to a bunch of different uh, populations. Um, some people will even post reviews. They'll kind of snap a picture of a five-star review of, hey, Dr. Smith, thank you so much for you know saving my mom's life. You're great, five stars, right? That's good content, too. And then comments, uh, especially through LinkedIn, some of you guys may know for better or for worse um, certain situations where you can post certain things um, and you either receive um, credible feedback for that or you can get into a let's call it a debate with somebody else, um, not agreeing with your opinion on social media. But that does spur um, conversation and can be something where you can learn you know, a little bit about that. So I think it's highly valuable to, to be involved with social media, but done the right way. And we'll get into that a little bit later. So where are you gonna post your content, right? We kind of talked about this a couple of times already, where you have all these different types of uh, tools that you can use, right? So typically what I notice, LinkedIn is obviously great for networking, right? All of us probably have LinkedIn accounts or know somebody with a LinkedIn account, um, either through your practice or, you know, other friends, but it's highly valuable. I've made a ton of connections throughout the interventional team management world, not just in the U.S., but even internationally through utilizing LinkedIn. It's so simple. 
Um, Facebook, this is kind of my own stereotypical spin on this, but I think it holds some truth. You know, people that are in their 20s are not really looking at Facebook anymore for resources. That's gonna be Instagram, TikTok, and the new threads that came out last week. That's really where they're getting their info from, um, even more so than Google searches a lot of times, believe it or not. Um, Instagram, TikTok, like we just talked about, it's more the younger population, but the younger population has, you know, older patients that might be pain patients, right? So it's important to get that up a bit. And then YouTube is pretty much everyone because that's where you can really post videos that typically don't have a, um, a length um, cut off. So if you have something that's maybe, you know, an hour procedure, or if you wanted to get something together of um, a highlight reel or whatnot, you can post that on YouTube and you typically don't have too many restrictions, at least in terms of the length. But there's plenty of other restrictions that it's not really the topic of this conversation, but you, know, you have that. Well, how, how many of you would like to post content or do something on one of your social media accounts, but you just don't really know how to do it? Like, okay, so e either in terms of physically, like, okay, how do I get a video? How do I post this? How do I do hashtags? How do I do all that fun kind of complicated stuff? Or even before that, like, what do I post? Like, you know, what's interesting? What's, um, you know, what can I do? Well, how am I gonna stand out? Is this going to seem, you know, dumb, for lack of a better term, right? So those are all things that, you know, I only have 15 minutes to speak. If anybody wants to, you know, approach me on that, um, you know, after or throughout the conference here, I'd be more than happy to discuss with. But, you know, those are things that, you know, you have to, um, I think, seek help if you don't really know how to do it. But part of that also is just sort of putting yourself out there and just doing it once and realizing your mistakes or you know things that you can improve upon with that and then you'll get more and more comfortable with posting. Um, benefits, we talked about some of these already. So reputation building I think is super key. Um, we were talking about Dr. Moygan before from Colorado. I've actually not met him in person before, but we've spoken and we've um, communicated, you know, through LinkedIn very often. That led to text message conversations, which you know is now going to lead to you know us meeting and you know, developing the relationship even more. And that wouldn't have happened without the social media aspect. Um, and I've had plenty of interactions like that um, throughout my you know, relatively small career. But um, it's important, and I think people really see what you're doing if you post certain things, and it helps increase your credibility. So networking, like we talked about, um, patient recruitment. I've had quite a few patients um, through multiple social media platforms, including YouTube, uh, reach out to me and say, hey, I like what you're doing here. Uh, where could I have that procedure? And I said, well, I practice in Florida, where at the time it was Arizona. And I tell them, and they'll come, and they'll seek you out, or at least um, you know, it'll give you um, an ability to help get a colleague um, that patient. It happened to be last week where the patient was living in Fort Worth and she wanted to get something in Fort Worth and I uh, hooked a colleague up that was in Fort Worth with this patient and it was nice for that aspect. Um, resources for existing patients. Some patients like seeing you do things outside of just your communication with them. They like to know that you're keeping up with um, certain things or they just like to say, oh, this is my doctor. Isn't he or she cool in doing this? And it's a nice thing for them to you know, kind of keep you involved that way. Um, team building, like we talked about, uh, and identity. It really helps to establish who you are, right? If somebody does a Google search on Jesse Hatches, you're gonna see you know, probably my website first, and then probably LinkedIn second, and maybe Facebook or Instagram third or fourth. So that's your first page Google results. That's what you're gonna you know, be showing the world, right? Um, Creating your own website for individuality and cohesion, I think, is pretty key. You know, we have a good website um, through APCC and through DXTX, but it's not really highlighting you as an individual practitioner, right? I mean, it shows a little bit about you. Maybe there's a blurb or potentially a video, but it doesn't really give the essence of who you are. So if you have a personal website, you can absolutely show that. I have patients 
that I redirect to uh, my website all the time, whether it's you know showing them the video of um, how I do a spinal cord stimulator implant, or just, okay, this is a listing and procedure that I have, or if you wanna know a little bit more about me, I have a bio on there too. So there's a you know, multitude of uh, interactive things that they could um, look at. Um, I, I would refrain from doing live uh, YouTubes of procedures while you're doing them. Mm -hmm. 100%. Okay. So don't film live. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a doctor who just recently lost her license for filming live. Just yeah. don't do it. I saw the video, I think, either yesterday or the day before from, I think it was Ohio. Uh, this ortho surgery, plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. Plastic surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was bad. So yeah, don't film procedures live. Stream live. Anything. You know, if you have a video, I have a few videos of um, like a spinal cord stimulator implants or trials, um, and I, I edit them, I splice them, and of course I make sure um, there's no HIPAA violation or anything to that. So, uh, like I said here, in place before posting, everything online has potential to last and forever. You could be a five minute hero or a building forever, right? So mm -hmm. just you have to be careful with what you actually post. Okay, so, uh, let's see. So this is an example on the left of a post that I did probably, probably about a week ago or so, I think, um, which we're using intradiscal ozone. Shout out to Javier. Um, we basically, um, for those of you who don't know, we can inject ozone into certain structures such as the discs, and patients do very, very well with this. So I thought it was cool. I thought it was something that not a lot of people do. So I posted and it was well received. Um, I had actually probably three or four PMNR um, and anesthesia-based pain providers that were very well known, you know, come come to me in the comments or individually message me and say, "What's that about? I never even heard about doing that. Could you could you teach me a little bit about that?" So it builds up that rapport, you know, gives you good reputation within that community, and just maybe even makes friendships within that. And then on the right is an SI joint um, fusion that we did. You can see the patient had a lumbar fusion you know, above that as well. The patient was doing extremely, extremely well. Um, I wrote a stat on there that uh, 50 to 75% of patients with lumbar fusion will wind up having um, significant pain in the SI joint that typically leads to some sort of surgical intervention within five years, which to me is a crazy statistic but very true, and I've seen that just anecdotally within my patient population. So I thought it was something cool, and I posted it. And most of the posts were very well received, and then I got one from a pain management doctor that said, pretty much, no, the posterior approach stinks. You should be doing the lateral approach. Why are you doing this? And it created a discussion. So not in agreement, but again, kind of spurred on a conversation, and. You know, I learned one or two things from the conversation I had with him, so it was a good learning opportunity for himself to do, but helped to kind of get it out there, and that's it. So I believe that was the last post, right? The last one, or other than this. Um, as true to my nature, if you want to find me on any of these social media platforms, there it is. Um, and then for anybody that wants to 